Joel E. Ferris High School. I got a great education at Ferris and we had fantastic teachers. There is such a special sense of friendship and community here. Those ties do last long past graduation day. It's an incredible place to teach, to be a student. Ferris, where kids can have the chance to be fantastic at what they do. In the mid-1950s, as the post-war baby boom was flooding its classrooms, Spokane Public Schools began preparation for a new high school on the city's south side. The school board weighed several site options for the new school. Ultimately, they voted to build it at 37th and Regal, an area that at the time was considered to be the sticks. Architects Royal A. McClure and Thomas Atkinson took advantage of the pine-covered 50-plus acres to design a campus in the mid-century modern architectural style. Nine independent classrooms and administration buildings were connected by covered walkways. Larger classrooms and hallways were made possible by the omission of corridors, and the numerous exits from each building were considered a safety feature. A 900-seat auditorium boasting state-of-the-art acoustics served as both performance space and lecture hall. This design would mesh with the cutting-edge teaching methods planned for the new school. There were a lot of classrooms that didn't have permanent walls, so you could have small groups or large groups or seminars. In the center of campus was a courtyard where students could mingle before and after school. It was wonderful in many ways. It was so nice to go outside and sit in the courtyard and have lunch, but in the wintertime, it posed a lot of problems. Spokane's newest high school might have been named after Marie Curie, Dwight D. Eisenhower, or Chief Spokane Gary, but the honor ultimately went to longtime Spokane banker, civic leader, and local historian, Joel E. Ferris. A civic powerhouse with a keen interest in education Ferris passed away at the age of 86 in 1960, about a year prior to the groundbreaking of his namesake school. In a nod to one of his lifelong hobbies, gardening, the Ferris estate contributed $10,000 to landscape the school's center courtyard. The entire project cost approximately $3.2 million and was considered a bargain. On September 3, 1963, Joel E. Ferris High School opened, without any upper classes, just sophomores, freshmen, and eighth graders. The first Saxon in cap and gown wouldn't graduate until 1966. 800 students entered a new school and began a new way of learning. Experiments with new teaching styles were being carried out across the nation, and Spokane Public Schools was no different. What became known as the Ferris System included a unique self-directed learning program that divided the school day into 15-minute increments. We might have a seminar from 8.10 to 8.35 and then we might have free time till 9.30 where it was up to us to be independent and study what we needed to study and use that time wisely. Then we might have a large group in the auditorium from 9.30 to 10.30. Classes were taught by a team of two to six teachers Working together, one teacher might deliver a lesson to a large group, while another focused on individual students. Teachers who started at the school were chosen from a long list of volunteers and from all over the district. Educators from foreign countries and every state in the West signed the school's guest book that year, arriving to observe the new teaching system. Meanwhile, Extracurricular activities at Ferris were similar to any other Spokane school. That first year, sports, music, and social organizations were created, and the freshman student body voted on a school nickname, choosing Saxons over the other ballot choice, Alpiners. Students also selected school colors of scarlet and silver. The school crest would come in 1965. One of the things that's been encouraged is to get involved in some way. We've preached this to those incoming eighth graders for as long as I can remember. It doesn't have to be a sport. It can be choral music or instrumental music. 
one of the clubs or, or whatever, but, but get involved. Back then there was the Girls League and the Boys League in addition to ASB, language clubs, I think there was even Future Farmers, and it certainly wouldn't happen today, there was even a rifle club. The first decades of any new school set the tone and customs for students, staff, and community to follow through the ages. Ferris soon developed its own rich traditions. Athletic programs winning league and state championships. Music programs performing at the highest levels. Impressive academic accomplishments. And a school environment encouraging students to follow their interests and become engaged with each other and their community. School spirit is very important here at Ferris, and not just school spirit in the sense of going to football games and dressing up, but school spirit in the sense that every club is truly supported. One cherished tradition is the Victory Bell. First principal Arthur Blowert helped the Key Club purchase the bell in 1969. Later that year, it tolled for the first time when the wrestling team won the city championship. It rang for athletic victories from atop the field house until 1976, when that year's senior class raised funds to place it in the courtyard. In this generation, it's really nice to know that they ring the victory bell for debate and choir and band concerts and, and all those student activities. I remember my freshman year, the debate team that I was on was able to go down and ring the victory bell, and you could hear it ring all throughout campus. But every basketball season since 1983, the ring of the victory bell is drowned out by the roar of the rubber chicken. The rubber chicken might be the most highly anticipated and joyous spirit game in town and, and maybe across the Northwest. It's been a great rivalry between Lewis and Clark and Ferris. I think it's brought our communities together and it's a friendly rivalry. That first fall of 1963, Ferris parents put on a variety show to raise money for their fledgling parent-teacher organization. What eventually became known as Ham on Regal evolved into a tradition of musical comedy productions, full of song, dance, and silliness. From writing the script, to playing in the band, to running the soundboard, more than 300 parents volunteer each season. Over the course of five decades, the Hams have raised more than $1.5 million. To benefit every aspect of Ferris High School, from the sciences to the athletics to the student activities, the arts, it's a phenomenal effort uh, and it's great to be a part of something that's so positive and generates such community spirit. By 1970, the student population had grown from 800 students to 2,000. The teaching staff from 39 to 90. Growing pains were everywhere. In 1971, the social studies classes that I taught were in the home ec building. So we always, we always ate well. Changes in the Ferris system came slowly, and by 1980, the school had transitioned to a traditional educational system. The campus design had lost its luster. Hot in the fall, hot in the spring, cold in the winter. But it was really run down. The smell would be distracting sometimes. The bathrooms were small and old, trying to traipse through the snow and not slip when you walked in on the tile floors. The passage of the 2003 school improvement bond by Spokane voters set the wheels in motion for changes to the Ferris campus. It funded the construction of the new gymnasium, health, and fitness complex. 40 years of PE, pep cons, and epic battles with GSL rivals had taken their toll on the original Ferris gym. Inadequate seating, substandard locker rooms, and a leaky roof had to be remedied. The new facility was dedicated in April of 2007. The court was named for legendary coach Wayne Gilman. The 54,000 square foot facility includes a main events gymnasium with seating for a crowd of 1,700 and nearly the entire Ferris student body. Amid the tall pines and natural setting, the gym's sloping roof gave the campus even more of an alpine character. 
in the athletic center, we do have sort of multiple roof lines and we're trying to break down a, a large building into smaller building masses so that it does look a little bit more village-like. And so when we continued on then with the next phase with the rest of the construction, we certainly tried to continue that theme, that idea. The opportunity to continue the project came with the passage of the 2009 bond to fund the comprehensive modernization of the entire school. NAC's architects and designers began a series of meetings with district and school staff, alumni, and community members to bring form to how a new Joel E. Ferris would look. One of the main goals was to get all the students under one roof. Um, primarily for safety, but also for uh, energy conservation. You know, when you have 15, 1600 kids opening and closing 100 doors a day, you let a lot of heating or cooling outside, and that's not a good way to spend uh, district dollars. And for safety reasons, you know, I think we all understand why it's important to have as few points of entry as possible. One of their directives was they really wanted to keep the auditorium and somehow uh, meld that into the, to the new design of the school. We kept the auditorium the size it was to accommodate the tradition of the music program at Ferris and Ham on Regal and just all the activities that go there. That big curving spine that is the main corridor that really starts at the gym and then links up to the auditorium. That was the idea, was to have this big curve that linked the two that pieces that we were keeping. And then off of that curve to have these wings that were more of the departments within. We had to design it in a way that school could stay in session in some of the uh, existing buildings while new construction was going on. Garco Construction of Spokane, the project's general contractor, had handled similar challenges with the rebuilding of Rogers and Shadle Park High Schools. Two when ground was broken three. in May of 2011, Garco was ready to begin a three-year process of modernization and transformation. Phase one began with the demolition of tennis courts and construction of the east parking lot. The science wing, general classrooms, kitchen, and commons were built next to the gym. With separate entries, the commons and gym can be used simultaneously for after-hours use. They might have football banquets in there, they might have some concert events in there, and I think it's been used for all those things. Food can be served from two kitchens, and students can enjoy a view of Tower Mountain while they eat or hang out. It's worked out really well because I know sometimes the talent show can be held there, or the drama department puts on skits, so it's really nice that it can be more of a multi-purpose area. After moving students and staff into the completed Phase One facilities, the old cafeteria, library, Building B, and administration building were demolished. Construction of the new library, remaining classrooms, and technical education wing began in the fall of 2012. The school auditorium was still a gutted shell in the spring of 2013, but the Hamlin Regal parents forged ahead like troopers, staging their 50th anniversary show in Gilman Gymnasium. The play must go on, and it did. The following year, after a complete renovation and upgrade, Paul G. Brueggemeyer Hall was rededicated in a public concert in February 2014. New seating, acoustical treatments, control booths and lighting system brought the storied home of so many wonderful musical and dramatic performances up to the most modern standards. Completion of the Phase II buildings allowed teachers and students to move out of the last original Ferris classrooms. For the first time in its history, all Joel E. Ferris students were under one roof. The day they took the G building down, the old science building, of course they demolished it and hauled away in trucks. And the first couple truckloads that go by, they drove past here, and I said to the students, there goes the G building. As the last of the old Ferris was hauled away, attention turned to building the central plaza and bus entrance. Students are dropped off at the back of the school now and enter past new courtyards created by the classroom wings. In the center of the plaza stands the Victory Bell, a proud monument to the school's past accomplishments and to achievements yet to come. 
to the passion and energy of Ferris students, staff, and community, continuing a tradition of excellence. Yeah!